felt the need today, um, out of respect, to take a moment of silence for what has just happened um, over the weekend. And so what I'd like is for all, us, all of us to do is take that moment of silence to remember our fellow Americans that have just gone through such a horrible tragedy. And what I'd like us to do is um, remember those that died, their families, those that were hurt, those that witnessed it, the first responders that were there, and on top of that, the families, the businesses, and the neighborhoods that were all impacted by what happened to those Americans um, on the other side of the United States. So if you wouldn't mind, if we could just take a moment of silence, and then we'll start. Thank you. Um, as I drove from my office here today, there were flags in downtown Gresham. I have no clue why, but it just charged me up that we would rally on this side of the United States. What is it Flag Day? Well, it's Flag Day and good for Gresham. But it just moved me that the flags would be out today. So I want to welcome you to the Government Affairs BLT, as I call it, the Business and Leaders Luncheon, or Business and Leaders Talk. Thank you for coming out today. We have an amazing topic. I can't wait for us to hear all sides of the topic. But as usual, and as is appropriate, I want to thank the sponsors for um, the sponsors of our event today. Portland General Electric is a presenting sponsor, as well as Riverview Community Bank. Larry, thank you very much for sponsoring and thank you to John as well. Our education sponsor is Gresham Barlow School District and we have the chair of the board here, Carla Peluso. I'm not sure you're representing Gresham today, but thank you for that. Appreciate that sponsorship. We also have Keith Thomas here, as always, behind the camera. He is our media sponsor, representing our media sponsor, Metro East Community Media. And we have a wonderful opportunity. He has a new boss. And his boss is really cool. His name's Marty Jones. I had a chance to meet him last week, and I can't wait for him to get in more engaged and more connected to the community. He's a fabulous asset. So our welcome and appreciation for the media sponsorship. We'd also like to recognize any other elected officials that are here today. So if you've been elected, would you please stand? We've got Councilman Stegman, thank you. Mike, hi, Michael Calcano. Shirley Craddock, thank you very much. Anybody else? A round of applause, they go through a lot. And it's not even election time and they're still here. We appreciate that, that's a good thing. And now we want to also rep um, recognize our board members. And I just did. So thank you very much. <laughs> We've got a lot of missing people here. Warner's coming, and I think Bonnie's going to be here, but um, neither one of them are here yet. So this is how it's going to work. We're going to have our panelists, all four of them, speak. And then after they're all done speaking, we're going to ask questions. Not, because we've changed things a little bit. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give the, um, the podium over to the chair of the Government Affairs Council so that he can now start the meeting. Be a sport. Now, boss? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'd also like to welcome you uh, again um, to our June um, Business Leaders Luncheon. This is a, um, I don't know if interesting is the right word, it's a distressing topic really that we're gonna discuss today. Uh, and the more I found out about it, <clears throat> the more I've learned about it in, in recent days, the more distressed I became about it. In fact, I became rather outraged about it. So um, today we have, uh, a very distinguished and extremely experienced panel to share their thoughts with us on the topic. <clears throat> this issue of sex trafficking is not just someone else's problem, uh, nor can we stereotype the youth or adults involved in this unthinkable crime. As you will hear from our panel, <clears throat> um, not all of whom is here, obviously, uh, today, Portland and Gresham are very desirable locations uh, for this crime, and we need to put a stop to it. 
The children need to flee from the terror, reclaim their lives if possible, heal, and move forward knowing they are valued and supported. <clears throat> so I hope today becomes somewhat of a catalyst for all of us uh, to get further engaged, more knowledgeable, <clears throat> and more involved in solutions to this problem. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Mel Jett, who's a program director for Harry's Mother. It's another local program that works uh, with the victims of sex trafficking. Portland police officers actually have Harry's Mother's phone number on their business cards and, and on their police monitors because Harry's Mother is an alternative to detention and a safe place to go. Um, thank you, Mel uh, Jett, for being here, and thank you for sharing uh, your perspective on this issue. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so as Brian said, my name is Mel Jett, and I uh, work with Janice Youth Programs um, and Harry's mother. And I've been with Janice for 14 years. Um, in the runaway youth side and the homeless youth side, currently the program director of Runaway Youth Services. And Janice really started getting involved in this topic of minor victims. We initially called it minor victims of sex trafficking back in, I wanna say 2005, um, under the reception center, which was just described, we're an alternative to juvenile detention. Um, and so we worked really closely with law enforcement, the FBI, um, SARC, the Sexual Assault Resource Center, Tanel was supposed to be here from SARC to talk about that piece. But our first goal when we first started addressing this issue was just to start to identify youth that are being sex trafficked in Portland. And um, fortunately and unfortunately, we knew that there were youth here. Um, and once we started identifying them, uh, we had to start creating services for them. We first started housing them and Harry's mother. We, our, our longest running program at Harry's mother is Garfield House. It's a shelter for runaway youth, ages nine to 17. And our biggest goal is family unification. Um, so youth can stay there three to five days. We support uh, all the youth that come through with free individual and family counseling offered for the community. Um, and so we started housing the population of CSEC youth. CSEC is the acronym, does everyone know? Uh, commercially Sexually Exploited Children. When we first started working with them, we called them minor victims of sex trafficking. Now it's commercially and sexually exploited children. Uh, so we started housing them in our basic center, in our shelter component, and quickly realized that was a bad idea for many reasons. <laughs> the first is safety to the general population of the youth that we serve. Um, unfortunately, Runaway youth are the most vulnerable to being sex trafficked. The, the national statistic is one in three youth that runs away from home will be approached by an exploiter within 48 hours of leaving home. So our Harry's Mother Services is super important. We've always been important. Our runaway youth shelter, um, our goal is to, again, be that safe place for youth to turn to instead of um, running into and being solicited by an exploiter that that can lead them into sex trafficking. Um, <clears throat> so we went to the city and the county and we rallied for support and got the whole community involved. And I'm proud to say that Athena House is our shelter for CSEC youth, ages 14 to 21. And we just celebrated five years and we just got funded for another five years. Uh, it's a seven bed shelter component and it's a long-term shelter. So youth can stay there up to 18 months. And we serve male and female survivors of sex trafficking. Um, and we work really closely with the panel here, <laughs> which is, is law enforcement, prosecuting attorneys, sexual assault resource center, and LifeWorks is another key um, partner of ours. So every youth that comes into our program, we refer to a SARC advocate, that sexual assault resource center, and they um, follow these young people wherever they go. So one thing we know about youth coming out of the life is what we call it, so coming out of sex trafficking, is it's really hard to leave that life um, there's a trauma bond that, that forms with their exploiter. Um, their exploiter has taken care of them and has become a really um, a father figure, however unhealthy that is, or a boyfriend, or someone that has really taken care of them in not a healthy way, but it's really hard to replace that. Um, so we replace that in as many ways as we can. With our shelter component, we um, 
also hire survivors. So I'm also really proud to say that in the last three years, we've made a big push to hire survivors so that youth coming out of sex trafficking can see hope on the other side. And over half of our staff at Athena House are survivors, um, which is really exciting. And we connect every youth with a SARC advocate and we connect them with more intensive trauma counseling through LifeWorks Northwest. Um, in the community, there's uh, many more partners invested in this topic as well, which unfortunately we don't have time to talk about all of them. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to talk about is our presence in East County or our presence that will be happening in East County. Um, I am hopefully by the end of the week we'll have a lease signed with the Nova Learning Center, the old Lutheran school off 182nd and Stark. We're going to have a Harry's Mother presence in East County um, that will help connect families and youth out here um, to our shelter component for Athena House and Garfield House and expand um, our alternative to juvenile detention. So we'll have some staff there in a more limited capacity in Portland, um, we're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That will still be the case, but in East County, we're gonna start with like a Monday through Friday, we'll be there till 8 p.m. and then on the weekends, we'll be there till 2 a.m. Um, and we also have two brand new positions through a federal grant, again, partnering with Multnomah County and SARC, um, all were benefiting from this grant. We got two outreach positions that are specifically for CSEC. So they're two um, workers that are gonna also be stationed out of that Nova Learning Center, but we'll be doing street level outreach and also working closely with law enforcement and doing an education component in schools and hospitals and community partners. Um, so connecting young people ages 14, they can go up to 24 with, uh, with services, so survivors of sex trafficking. <clears throat> so really exciting things happening, not only with Janice, but with the whole community and all of our community partners that have worked really hard. Um, and that, I know I have such a limited time, and in a nutshell, is trying to capture everything we do, but. You may have more time than you think. Oh, okay. Well, obviously I have more time, yeah. <laughs> I know Mike will roll in here, too, but yeah, if there's questions. <clears throat> what, why is Portland such a hotbed? So I would say it's a hotbed for a couple of reasons. One is our access, um, Again, to the, like easily the I-5 corridor and traveling in and out. We're also a port internationally. But more than that, I think Portland, uh, I was talking to Brian about, is um, we, have, we have the highest per capita of sex, uh, of strip clubs in Portland, right, for the country. We have higher number of strip clubs than most of the country. We have made the commodification of sex really acceptable and easy, um, and that uh, also, I think is, is a one way that youth get involved in being trafficked. We have a lot of buyers here. So the buyers that are purchasing sex, um, <clears throat> I think because it has, it has become somewhat normalized. But that was, was one from my experience. Yeah. Well, we have more here. What can be done about, about the sex workers or allowed to have legislation that would, I don't know what the laws say about limiting the number of strip clubs. Is there we can't. Yeah. yeah. Do you know the answer to that? No. Our, con our I, constitution, our state constitution is more liberal than most state constitutions on free speech. And that's how it, it all started. And I know that because of the one at Beef and Brew that was just down the street. So when we looked into it, that's when we realized that our state constitution, <coughs> way back when, those pioneers wanted everything. And they got it. And uh, strip clubs are not the only way that youth are sex trafficked. I think my point there is more that we just, as a, as a society, have a better, um, not a better, a bigger, we're more liberal or like it becomes easier to buy sex. But most of these girls that we encounter are being solicited and sold and through uh, the internet. So through pages like Backpage and, um, or they're exploiters. I mentioned if youth run away, the one in three are, are approached by an exploiter. Sometimes that's online. So there are people online exploiting Facebook and just reaching out and they're so good at identifying these high risk populations. Um, and, and getting them into the life. Gangs are also big in Portland uh, in 
being the pimps, the exploiters of these young people. Yeah. I see my, my calipers here, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that definitely an urban area. I think also, to be honest with you, it's because we're identifying them. I, where you're going to find a high number in rural areas as well. But I think because we have a lot here also because we've started to identify them. And I think once you start to uncover that rock, we're, you're going to find them all over. We have found more here because we're looking for them. I'm a retired school principal, elementary principal. I'd be interested in your comments on the sex trafficking in the high schools uh, in terms of, uh, well, what can you tell about, about that? Because I'm sure our high school girls are also being approached in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think the most common there probably is gang involvement, um, getting solicited into the gang and, and being bought and sold that way. Um, as far as how to... I think the, big, the bigger question maybe is how to address it. And one thing that I think we would love to see as service providers and this panel is just talking about it more openly um, in the same way that we do a lot of prevention with um, disease or STDs or you, you won't start talking about why it's important to wash your hands because you're going to get sick. It's important to talk about healthy relationships and just starting even there. Like if you're approached by an older boy or man that's one that's really interested in being friends with you like should you pay attention to that and what is what are they looking for and what are some of the signs and and not even necessarily having to immediately have a, a conversation about sex trafficking but just healthy relationships and like how at risk people young people can be to other to people that want to exploit them yeah so what are we actually talking about with these people these children what what's the process and what What's going on, I guess? Does Mike want to do that part of it? I'm either one, but. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Mike's blazing. Yeah. Uh, so let's walk through a scenario. Um, so a youth leaves home or they've run away. One way they may be approached is in person. And uh, a gentleman, a young man might say, hey, baby, you look really, you're looking good. Where, what are you doing out here all by yourself? And they are start to like, give them compliments, um, they're telling them how beautiful they are, they're, they're filling a need that they haven't gotten at home. So they're not getting love and attention at home, and this older gentleman, generally, comes up and starts to give them attention, um, becomes their boyfriend, and, right, and then they, they start having sex with their boyfriend. Um, it's okay. And then that's not enough, the boyfriend is like, hey, you need to help us put food on the table. I'm going to take care of you. You help take care of us. Now I want you to have friend, sex with my friend here and my not friend here. And like suddenly this, um, what started as just, a, it felt like a relationship turns into a, a way of being exploited that the young person has slowly been groomed into. Is that, can I answer your question? And then once they're in that, they're, um, this trauma bond is so strong and exploiters are so good at filling that role that it's a cycle of um, power and coercion. And um, so it can start as just, you're gonna do this for me because you love me. And then, no, you're gonna do this for me because I'm gonna beat you up. Or there's serious harm and danger to the youth for leaving that situation. Um, I think I was at a meeting recently where uh, it was best described as, I think we're, with CSEC right now, um, and sex trafficking, where we were with DV 10 years ago and kind of understanding that cycle of how hard it is for victims to get out of that cycle. Um, that kind of put it into context for me. I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> Great, thank Bye. you. Don't go away, because I know there's going to be more questions for <laughs> the panel as a whole. So, we're back in form again, and um, it's a pleasure to introduce the other two panelists here today. Um, joining us uh, here is Sergeant Mike Gallagher, Portland Police Bureau, uh, who heads the sex crime unit for all of Portland, and I believe is a resident of Gresham. Uh, his work at East uh, Portland Precinct is the only unit in all of Portland specific to the sex trafficking uh, issue. Men and women work in this unit to s safely get the children off the streets 
and arrest those responsible for sex crimes. <clears throat> and I'll be very anxious to hear more about that process. Also, we have with us, um, to my far right, Multnomah, Multnomah County Deputy District, uh, <laughs> District Attorney, uh, Glenn, who goes by JR, I understand it, uh, Yuji Fusa, and don't ask me to spell that. Uh, he prosecutes the sex trafficking cases. I am also told that he did an amazing job at the uh, Door to Grace fundraiser this spring, uh, bringing faces uh, and facts to the audience so that they could understand this better. Door to Grace is an organization which uh, works with the victims of sex trafficking. So uh, back on schedule, it's my pleasure to first introduce Sergeant Mike Gallagher from the Portland Police Bureau. I think we're gonna speak together because we work together as a team. Um, I'm actually an officer, I wish I got the sergeant's pay, but I've been, <laughs> been doing this long enough, I probably should be a sergeant. Um, as I said, I'm Mike Gallagher with the Portland Police Bureau. I've been with Portland for almost 25 years now, and pretty much my whole career, I've been involved in some sort of prostitution investigations. I worked 18 years on the street, but I worked almost all of the missions, the undercover missions that we put on. And about <clears throat> seven years ago, um, I joined the sex trafficking unit. It was called the Prostitution Coordination Team, which was formed when JR, his DA's office, partnered with us. And our focus at that time was basically livability issues, getting the prostitutes who were on 82nd Avenue, Stanley Boulevard, off the streets. And we sort of had to get creative on how to do that because we figured by arresting them time and time again wasn't working. We couldn't arrest our way out of this problem. Our focus was on prostitution, the livability issues. And so our focus has changed into helping the victims, uh, working with minors, uh, providing them resources to get out of the street, and, and arresting and holding accountable the buyers, the Johns that are out there making these purchases and, and fueling this demand for prostitution. So in a nutshell, that's sort of where we've gone. I'll let him, JR, introduce himself, and we'll talk a little bit more. So thanks for having me. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, part of the non-traditional way in which we approach these cases means that sometimes I don't wear a suit. So I apologize for not being in a suit. I actually ran from meeting a victim who's in a shelter right now and speaking with her for a detective, with a detective. And if I wear a suit to some of those meetings, I think it's really intimidating and they feel like I'm just part of the man. And so uh, very often, part of this non-traditional is being able to make cases and being flexible. So we are in the same, like he said, in the same precinct. And we, I don't work nine to five, Mike doesn't work nine to five. We work whenever these cases are happening and whenever we're called out. So I apologize for being late to that. She finally, after four interviews, opened up about what had happened and uh, the time slipped away a little bit. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, seven, five, eight years ago, uh, I was out at East Precinct doing livability issues and we, as Mike said, realized that human trafficking isn't just prostitution. And in fact, prostitution is the most visible crime. But really, if you look into what that crime is about, it's about mostly men, some women, exploiting people who are vulnerable uh, in order to make money. That crime uh, that we have been dealing with has taken a lot of different shapes and forms, but ultimately it's preying on victims and getting them to do what uh, they want them to do, which is an illegal act under uh, our laws, and hiding behind that illegal act by acting as a boyfriend or uh, sometimes a father figure and exploiting those individuals who may be missing out on those sort of father figures or that love that a boyfriend will provide to them. So how many of you have seen the movie Taken? You ever seen the movie Taken? Okay. That's what we think about with human trafficking, right? We think about someone being dragged out from underneath in a bed, being put into a, a, a work camp and being locked in a room and men coming in and out. What we actually see is much more complicated and much harder to investigate and prosecute, and that is the boyfriend role. What we see is a woman or a girl who has some trouble at home or has some trouble with their parents who runs or who is looking for someone to understand them, and a trafficker coming in to say, I understand what you need and what you want, and I'll provide everything you want and need. And during that relationship, that trafficker changes to now that I've done all these things for you, you owe me. So there's this, there's this grooming, and by the time we have contact with these victims, they're in love with their trafficker. They believe their trafficker is their boyfriend. And so when I heard 
the reference to domestic violence and how that uh, how this sort of movement is where domestic violence was, there's a lot of similarities. As you can imagine, or anyone you may know who've been involved in domestic violence, they are very reluctant to testify about their husband or their significant other because of the consequences of their family, of them, maybe of their children. Well, we see that to a much heightened degree when we're talking about sex trafficking. So when Mike and I sort of joined this group, we realized that we couldn't tackle this issue like a traditional prosecutor, where I sit downtown, <laughs> officers interview victims, and then they send me the case. We need to be much more uh, easy to, you know, uh, non-traditional means. Sometimes it means I meet a victim out in a hotel room with Mike, or sometimes we meet at a coffee shop, or I go into a secure facility, and we try to do things differently to make better results. I think one of the ways to understand why these victims get involved in this, and you know, I used to believe when I was a newer cop um, that it was their choice. It was their choice to go out and work 82nd Avenue. It was something they wanted to do, something they made money at. And after talking to, I've probably talked to over 2,000 women involved in prostitution. And after you hear story after story, story about their life, I, I've come to realize it's not a choice they want to do. And, and sort of piggybacking on what JR is saying, the best way to understand it, at least from my perspective, was it was described to me as selling the dream. That you have a victim that's missing a piece of their life, and you sort of refer to this a little bit. And a story I, I tell of a, a victim I talked to in Seattle, she was unemployed, had a four-year-old little boy, living with her brother, didn't see any future new job opportunities coming up. She's a little bit overweight, didn't have a lot of high respect or high self-esteem. And she posted on one of the, she posted actually in Plenty of Fish, a dating website. And an individual contacted her, told her how beautiful it was, told her how she should have boyfriend after boyfriend, told her how he loved kids, told her that you know she should be doing better than living with her brother, took her out, got her hair done, got her nails done, took her out to a nice restaurant, brought her kid toys, and said he wanted to be a father. And she fell in love with this guy in a matter of days, because he promised her everything that she was looking for. And that's the way she described it. She said that he, he told me and promised me everything I was looking for at that time in my life, so I fell for this guy. And that's what we see in these victims, whether they come from troubled families, foster home systems, runaways, to kids that come from the perfect household, with, you know, parents that are married and they go through good schools, there's something missing in their life that these, these traffickers pick up on and find that, that uh, chink in their armor and will take advantage of that. So it's truly not a choice they're making. They don't go into this at 15, 16 years old. You don't go into prostitution thinking you're gonna make a million dollars doing it, right? It's not something that we normally grow up to do. It's something that somebody's convinced them to do and taken them down that path where they can't choose to get out of it. So I wanted to mention a little bit about Multnomah County and sort of locally what we've done. Right now, state sentences in Multnomah County are higher than federal sentences as far as sex trafficking goes. And uh, some of that is based on the good work from legislature, le legislators and the laws we've been able to change to go after traffickers. So I, tra I prosecute both state and federal laws. They're a little bit different, but most state cases could be a federal case. But what we have found is uh, Multnomah County judges, uh, the state of Oregon has very good laws in which to allow us to prosecute individuals. And so Mike and I have taught all around the country trying to show individuals in Chicago or New York or Arizona how to duplicate what we've been doing here. That being said, uh, we always get questions about what does Portland rank? What does Oregon rank? What does Multnomah County rank as far as sex trafficking? I'm unable to answer that question. Not because I don't think it's important, but because I think that um, there are a lot of high vice states and areas that sex trafficking is extremely lucrative and frequent. This is not a crime in which victims identify as victims. It isn't. Similar to a lot of sexual assault cases, these victims, most of the time, like I said, the victim I was just speaking with, it took her four times talking with a DA and investigator to admit, yeah, this is what actually happened to me. And when they do admit that prostitution occurred, it's usually this was my idea, I wanted to do it, I was just trying to help out. So they still don't recognize themselves as a victim. They have been talked into the idea that um, this was their idea and their boyfriend or their trafficker, however they want to refer to them, was just living with them, was just their companion and they did what they needed to do and he just 
couldn't get a job because he didn't want to, something like that. So when we try to figure out the numbers, that's a really hard question for me to answer. But what I will say is that we've tried to look at some of the numbers of victims, child victims, in the system right now. And in sort of the Portland area, which includes from Gresham to Beaverton, uh, to parts of Clackamas, we identified about 469 individual victims in a four-year time period that have touched the system that are children. So if that gives you an idea of sort of just a small piece of the iceberg, of the scope of the vic children who are victims in this area, those are children who are identified through treatment, through DHS, through uh, advocacy, through cases that were victims of human trafficking. 469 from 2010 to 2014, I believe, is the study uh, produced by PSU. So that will give you an idea of how many children that we come in contact with, either through the law enforcement side or through treatment providers or through runaway shelters or ad advocacy groups who have identified children. Now, I would say that there is a lot more adult victims. The majority of our cases are adult victims. And when I talk about adult victims, Mike talked about choice. We're also talking about adult victims who are intimidated or forced to do that as well, besides just lacking choices in their lives. I think what's probably most important for you is to answer your questions, though. So I just want to give you an idea about numbers and the scope of these things. We can talk a little bit more about prosecution or investigation uh, or anything like that that you have questions about. I, I think it's a lot more helpful if we answer questions from you. I've got a couple comments real quick. And our team consists of myself, another officer, and a sergeant at East Precinct. As most of you probably heard, Portland's sort of short-staffed. Uh, they're cutting a lot of units they haven't cut our they cut our unit in half but it hasn't gone away yet so that's a positive thing and there's also three detectives and a sergeant that work downtown we're sort of the street unit we're the ones that run the undercover ads set up the stings make con you're usually we're the ones that make the first contact out there with the victims of trafficking but we're also the ones that deal with the buyers we're the ones that put the fake ads and, and arrest the, the johns that are out there purchasing and for the last probably two or three years straight, we've, we've switched our focus from when I first started in this unit, our focus was arresting about 80% women and about 20% men, and we flip-flopped it now. Our focus is now is arresting and educating the buyers, and we'll, our, probably about 80% men will arrest this year and 20% women. And you ask, why do we arrest women? Sometimes if we arrest the women, it's the push they need to get them the help that they need through the system. We have resources and advocates that will get them the drug treatment and the mental health counseling, but sometimes we have to force them through the courts to get them in that system. Um, so that's one of the ways we do that and use that as a tool to help them understand that this is really not a choice that they're making to stay in this lifestyle. And then we provide a, a, a John school, a buyer school for the man that they have to pay to go to, and part of that money goes to help the victims, but it gives them a class on what prostitution truly looks like, sort of the down and dirty prostitution education 101. And we get some really good results and comments at the end of that class from what their perception of what prostitution is at the beginning of the class to what it is at the end of the class. And we had a lot of comments like, I didn't realize, I'll never do this again, I wish I'd known this before, you know, I made that date, those types of things. Uh, men who purchase minors aren't afforded that class. They don't have that choice. They get JR and they get to go to jail, so. <laughs> Good. What are we teaching our children to avoid this that are already know it all? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I have four kids, a daughter who's 12 right now. My youngest victim was 12 in one of my cases. I think that prevention is a huge piece of this puzzle. Not prevention at seniors in high school, I think that's way too late, but I think prevention in elementary and junior high about what is a healthy relationship, how we treat each other, and that's a great question. And there's a, there's a couple of different groups that are working into getting into schools and other areas to teach these kids about what that means, because one of the things we find with traffickers is that they have some sort of familiar relationship with the crimes of prostitution or trafficking. They either had a mother who was a victim, a dad who was a trafficker, an uncle who was involved. And so this, not always, but it's an indicator that it passes down from generation to generation because it's known by them, this is how, this is a way to make money. This is a way to do those types of things. And so we need to do that prevention piece because I hate to say it, but I think every high school in the area we've had victims out of whether it's Lake Oswego High School or 
Rex Putnam or Lincoln or Grant or wherever, Gresham, there, we have had victims in every high school. So it's not just a poverty issue. It's not just a homeless issue. It's not just a runaway issue. It's sort of a self-esteem issue and an issue about um, wanting to be loved or be treated a certain way that sort of transcends socioeconomic boundaries. So I, I'm working with a group right now, Northwest Family Services, that's putting together curriculum for middle-aged schools. I think this past year that they've taught close to two to 3,000 kids a curriculum aimed at sort of understanding what trafficking looks like, how to, how to report it, you know, what to look for, the warning signs. There's two or three other groups that, um, that are in the Portland area. Sexual Assault Resource Center has a curriculum they're doing in some of the Portland schools. Uh, Libby Spears has a curriculum that's uh, high school age curriculum. So like you said, we're starting to get them to understand, and, and that middle school I think is huge, to get somebody that's you know, 12, 13 year old, that's sort of that prime age for those recruiters to step in and, and make those promises. Of the uh, pimps that are prosecuted and uh, sent to jail, I'm wondering what's the average uh, term? And also, have there been any studies once they come out? Do they go back to their old uh, habits, or do they move along into something else? And if so, what might that be? Yeah, those are all fantastic questions. I can't give you an average, but I'll give you a range. So in Multnomah County, we have prosecuted individuals who have served life without the possibility of parole in prison for their crimes. Uh, I would say if you have multiple victims and you're a trafficker, you're looking at between 15 and 35 years in prison. And that just happens to be how many victims are willing to testify, the strength of the evidence. But it is a long sentence. In Oregon, the main charge we use is compelling prostitution. It's about measure 11, 70 month mandatory minimum sentence. So that gives me the tools that if I have four victims that have been engaged or forced to engage in prostitution for weeks, some of those charges can stack upon each other. That's the nice thing about Oregon law. We have great laws when it comes to con consecutive sentences versus concurrent sentences. In the federal law, it's a higher mandatory minimum. It's between 10 and 15 years, depending on the facts. But there is no consecutive sentencing. And so it's a different sort of uh, sentencing guideline. Your second question, right? Studies about traffickers coming out. I failed to mention, I usually put this out here first because I want you to understand sort of the, the pull for trafficking. On any given day on one web page that we know is involved in advertising prostitution, there's between 200 and 400 ads of different women. Each one of those ads, based on when we do an undercover operation, can generate between 50 and 150 calls from men. So just multiply that for one day You've got, let's, let's do an easy math, let's say 100 ads, and they generate 50 calls. That's 5,000 individuals who are calling to offer money. Now those dates range from anywhere from 50 to $500 a piece. So if you're criminally oriented and you're looking for something to make money tax-free with low risk, the word is out that trafficking is the way to do it. I mean, we have traffickers that say, I make about $2,500 a night tax-free. And I don't do a single thing. My girlfriend does it all. There has been a study that talked about how much traffickers make in Chicago. They interviewed a bunch of traffickers who were in custody, in prison, and the average was about $250,000 a year, tax-free is what traffickers are making, trafficking other individuals. So now you can see sort of the pull in the criminal element, right? We think trafficking is the second most lucrative crime out there besides drugs. And drugs is just a vast sheer quantity of it. Because drugs, you have to have money in order to sell drugs. You have to purchase your drugs, split it up, you have to risk yourself out on a corner, maybe dealing with undercover officers. Where in trafficking, you may already have a girlfriend who was dancing at a club, or maybe was already doing this before. And you just have to talk her into giving you all your money, all her money. So the second question about when they get out, the sort of recidivism rate, I guess, is what you would ask. For traffickers that we deal with that we would say are prolific traffickers or individuals who are dangerous traffickers who fall under the compelling prostitution statute, there's a high level of psychopathy associated with traffickers. They have personality disorders. Most likely an aggressive narcissism is what their personality disorder is. And sort of the definition of personality disorder is you're not gonna change that. 
So a lot of the traffickers I deal with that we go after for large sentences, they have an evaluation done, a psychological evaluation done. And most of them sky score extremely high in psychopathy. They're psychopaths. They're individuals who are just worried about themselves. So given that, there hasn't been a study done, but I have a lot of concerns for recidivism, and I've prosecuted a lot of traffickers multiple times, or not myself, because I haven't been in the DA's office that long, but who have served long sentences before for trafficking, who have gotten out and just tried to be better at it, rather than being reformed. And so that's concerning, right? And that's why we ask for extremely long sentences to warehouse them, because there's no other options, for an extremely long time so they can't exploit other victims. So I hope I answered your question well enough. I wish there was a study on that. That would be very interesting to see. But I do know that based on my experience, the psychopathy is extremely high for most of these traffickers. So, and, and these cases are extremely hard to work. I mean, your victim, like you said, doesn't self-report, doesn't self-identify. And your victim is our evidence. When you talk, give the example about the person on the corner selling drugs, if we catch him with drugs in his pocket, we put the drugs in jail, hold them there until the court date, the DA asks us to go get the drugs, we bring them to the court, you guys look at the drugs, we testify that they're in his pocket, it's a pretty easy conviction, right? Our evidence now is the victim. And the court, you know, the trial may be six months from now, maybe eight months from now, and now the victim's either back home, doesn't want anything more to do with this stuff, or she's to another state with her trafficker, and trying to find her, locate her, to get her to be willing to testify against somebody she loves is very, very hard to do. So that's, again, why we work with these victim advocates to get them to better understand how they're being forced into this lifestyle. Hi, Craig Ward from Troutdale. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is the, uh, the story that I heard or read about that one of the reasons that Portland was, um, was sort of a you know, a problem area here is because of the port and the notion that, that we have um, uh, sex slaves being imported. Uh, and I know that there are stories of that happening um, elsewhere. Sounds to me like uh, your illustrations are all kind of a homegrown business. And that's really what you're seeing. Is there much um, of this uh, importation going on? Sh sure, there is. There is. But I would say the, Sorry to hear that. the vast majority are local kids. Because if you're a trafficker, one, there are organized trafficking rings. But the majority are not organized trafficking rings. They are co common criminals, local criminals, who have decided this is more lucrative than selling drugs. Or this is more lucrative than selling guns. And they're not going to invest the time or the money to work with international crime syndicates to bring victims here when they can go to the local high school and find dozens of kids who parents work at night, who have self-esteem issues, who are looking for an older man to shower them with gifts. So by far, I would say 90% and above, our victims are local Oregon kids. OK, good. Fair enough. So a, a little deviation. Um, from the theme, and I realize you guys are involved in sex trafficking <clears throat> per se. Um, I, my wife and I were picked up once at a city far away um, by you know one of these hotel shuttles, and when when we were picked up, the lady who was driving the hotel shuttle laid this whole story on us, which I think was quite sincere. And she's she's a you know an all American uh, woman. Um, uh, and what she was busy complaining about was her boss, who essentially was underpaying her. And, and in that context, she brought up the fact that, that her boss was importing workers to the United States, paying a minimum wage to work in the hotel. I'm sure none of our hotels are guilty of this, so don't you know, tag me with that. This was far, far away. Um, but, uh, and it truly was. But, um, that, that was an aspect of, of human trafficking that had never occurred to me, that effectively this was a, a person who was victimizing people by bringing them into the United States, and then they got paid minimum wage, but in order to get paid minimum wage, he got a kickback of part of their salary. So they were, and then they, he, he put them up in a hotel room. So he had, you know, six people in a hotel room, and, um, and that's, that's, you know, that's how he, he enslaved these people. They were here under work visas or whatever. They couldn't make enough money to get by. They were all sort of, you know, truly enslaved. And that was how they were making the money to maintain their hotels. So do you, 
are you aware of that kind of pattern around? You are. I, so that's called I keep labor asking, trafficking. I keep hoping you say no. Sure, but. sure. That, that's called labor trafficking. And there is a, a group that uh, works on labor trafficking as well. I'm part of that group. There is labor trafficking and then there is sex trafficking. Mm. There's also what I came to know based on I have adopted brother from Rwanda. Is that, there's actually sports trafficking. People who are trafficked for, who are athletes from other countries, whether you're, my brother was 6'11 from Rwanda, he got trafficked into this country to play basketball. They do the same thing in the Dominican Republic or other places for baseball players where they have people who are exploiting them. But that's called labor trafficking. And a lot of times we see it in the hotel business, the restaurant business, the agricultural business. Uh, some of the dynamics are the same, right? Because they're exploiting people who have a vulnerability. Many are very different though, because, um, they are not usually homegrown victims. They're victims who are coming in from across the border that uh, either are here illegally or have some other vulnerability that they're trying to work off, right? Almost like a debt bondage. But yes, we are aware of those. There are laws that are written for that purpose. And there's actually a work, work group that includes the FBI and Homeland Security that deal with those issues as well. So yes, that is, that is here as well. But, but there is a piece to that that does its labor and sex that they're bringing them over and having them work as sex workers to right. pay off the debt that they owe the family or whatever it is in the foreign countries. But there is that going on right now too and we're investigating those types of cases too. I have a quick question before we go to Michael and then we have another one here. If, you, if you're in law enforcement and you write tickets those tickets all add up. If you're a law enforcement and you don't write tickets, then it looks like nothing is being done. Are we in an area where you guys are aggressive and and we have a reputation of having a high number of sex trafficking because we're actually actively looking for them compared to other communities that aren't? Or are we truly in the situation that was described earlier, that it's a high area? I think it's a little bit of both. You're right, if, if you bring attention to the issue, it looks like you have a bigger issue. I think it's a little bit of both. I think we've been working on this for years and years, and so we have some numbers to back up what we're talking about. I also think that when I just described the amount of demand, how many men are out there seeking sex, we have a huge issue as well. And you know, for me, when I say huge issue, a minor being trafficked that gentlemen around this city are paying when they walk into a hotel room and see a 12-year-old and they're okay with it, one of them is a huge issue for me. But I think there are a lot of areas that close their eyes to this that they have a huge issue as well. If you were to get online the same website I'm talking about and you type in Salem or Eugene or the coast, all of those cities have a problem because this has moved out of the high vice area of 82nd Avenue and it's moved on to the World Wide Web where any home, and I mean any hotel, any home, there's trafficking going on because you just need to make an agreement online and meet it at, 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 a, at a place. So it goes on at every hotel, whether it's the Benson or you know whatever the hotel is, it goes on everywhere. I mean, we do missions from every hotel imaginable and it doesn't matter. It's all online now. So the, the days of sort of street walking on a high vice area, so it was contained to 82nd Avenue or Sandy Boulevard or 162nd, wherever that may be, those days are long gone. And now it's anywhere, whether that John or how buyer wants them to be at their home or wants to meet their some, them somewhere else. I think it's sort of, <clears throat> communities tend to stick their head in the sand and not say we don't have a problem because you don't have a track. People aren't there actually you know, walking down the street getting picked up by John's because you don't see it because it's in the hotel rooms. But we've done trainings. We just did a mission down in Wilsonville where we had eight custodies. We did training in West Lynn where the phone, we posted a fake ad there in West Lynn and the phone rang all day of buyers wanting to meet the, the girls that set up. So these community, Westland doesn't even know if I have a hotel. I didn't realize that until we did the training out there. <laughs> so we set it up, we were gonna meet them in a, an apartment building. But that's, I mean, it is literally everywhere. We advertised we were in Westland and the phone rang off the hook. So whether you wanna realize it's there or not, it's going on everywhere, like he says. And our victims may come from Vancouver, right? They may, they may stay a night in Portland, then may, they may stay a night in Troutdale, <laughs> and then they may, Stay a night in Boise, it's, it's a sort of transient crime too. They're moving. And so any stop along the way is an opportunity to make money, they're going to do that. And when I taught down in Newport, one of the things I tried to explain to them is you don't have the problem like we do in Portland, but they're recruiting your girls to come to Portland to work. You need to realize that because, you know, think about it being stuck in a city, a city like that, and all of a sudden you're offered this opportunity to come to Portland or go to LA or go to Las Vegas, and you got a big fight with your parents, 
this guy sends you bus money to get away and do something a little bit different, then you're trapped. So you may not have the problem like we do on 82nd Avenue or used to have, but they're recruiting your girls. They don't care what city you're from. So I want to thank you three all for uh, being here today and for the good work that you're doing. It's so, so important. Uh, my understanding, you know, with Portland having the highest percentage of, of strip clubs per capita, I think is the statistic, is that that's a big factor in this issue. Um, and uh, it's my understanding that uh, the, the, the women who are working in these strip clubs can, are, are just contractors. And that is a part of the problem because age verification and those types of things those aren't direct employees, they're just paid as contract. Is that a part of the problem that you're seeing? And is there any sort of solution to uh, approach the issue from that perspective with those strip clubs being such a, a fertile breeding ground for sex trafficking? That's a great question. He's not a plant, but I'll tell you that that <laughs> is an issue we have been working on, and we actually proposed something to the legislature that they didn't like. But that is a huge issue, and I'll tell you some of the reasons, in my opinion, that that's a huge issue. We have, I think the actual is adult shops per capita, is the way it's said. And so we have a thriving, what you would call, legal sex industry here. That does two things. That is a breeding ground for grooming victims. If I have a victim that I'm grooming, maybe I'll start her out dancing. And then I can say, see, you made $100 tonight. You can make 10 times that. You just need to do the next step. So one, it's a breeding house for grooming. Two, yes, there's an issue with general contractors. And we've gone into clubs and said, hey, did you, do you know who was working last night? And the bouncer says, I don't know. I think the DJ maybe let someone in. And the DJ says, I don't know. Maybe the manager let someone in for who's actually at those clubs. And so we have a handful of cases where we've had 14, 15, 16, 17-year-olds dancing at these clubs that are put up there by their trafficker to groom them, that we have no evidence, no sort of accountability, no record of where they were and what they were doing. Now, those are crimes in and of themselves. If you allow a minor to dance uh, at any lewd conduct in front of an adult, that's a crime as well. But it definitely, definitely relates to trafficking. That concept of our First Amendment gives you the right, to, the right to have sort of that more liberal sexual acts. That's also sort of that uh, argument that traffickers use to say, hey, it's OK. You know, this is, this is fine, right? Everyone's doing it. After these dancers are done, some of them are meeting clients afterwards in the parking lot. And this is just the general progression. So I think one that creates, like I said, grooming techniques, but also a lot of times the same patrons who are there are then trolling the internet for what's happening after this closes, right? Hey, I'm going to go find a girl after, after I'm done with this. And we see that as well. Mike, you want to add that? Yeah, I mean, think about sort of pick, on, Rebecca Bender says it very well. She describes it as that gradual expansion of boundaries. So they say, you know, all you got to do is sometimes they start out by shoplifting, you know, go in and steal five pairs of pants and they resell them or take them back. Then it's like, we'll get into stripping because that's legal. And then, you know, she comes back and says, well, you know, somebody offered me $200 to, to go out in the car with them. And the guy says, well, you know, you're having sex with me, you know, just go out there and do what he asked you to do. You get extra $200. I mean, you have to work less that way, right? And it's very easy to sell that gradual expansion of boundaries to do with this small thing to another small thing. And pretty soon you're in it at 110% and you can't get out. Okay, we've got uh, three minutes left and two questions. Sarah and Sorry, then Brian, no? Okay. okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm with Human Solutions. Um, we have a family shelter and potentially we're in the process of getting a new women's shelter too. And what are, and maybe this is something for you to answer, but um, maybe what are some signs to look for? Because um, it sounds like a lot of these victims aren't really open or immediately open about their experiences and they don't want to call out the person that they love. Um, are there some general signs that maybe we could pick up that might hint at um, some trafficking is taking place? Well, so, sure. <laughs> There's a million of them. There, there, are, there are a lot of them. Um, uh, cell phones, two cell phones it can be a sign or not wanting to give up a cell phone or being really overprotective of their cell phone and worried about not answering their cell phone. As, as one sign that we see, um, that expensive items or a lot of a lot of items, um, 
but that, that's kind of a generalization. A, a lot of the ways that we have been identifying them too, though at Harry's Mother is very different because we have a close relationship with law enforcement. And so a lot of the youth that we're seeing have already been identified either through the Child Protective Services through the DHS system or um, law enforcement is bringing them in because they responded to a noise violation at a hotel and they picked up a girl that was in a hotel with three older gentlemen. And so there's a pretty big sign right there that, that we get a little more information than you might get at Human Solutions. Um, when things, we typically think of traffickers as, as males. Um, mm -hmm. That's typically what we see, but there's also females out there preying on these young women. I mean, they're, they're not as scary, you know, to try to, you got a trafficker who has their bottom, that's the person, sort of their favorite, who may go out and recruit other girls. Um, so you may not see the, the boyfriend there initially, but the money that will work its way up that food chain to the trafficker, like you say, unexplained high dollar items that they're getting, uh, maybe unexplained trips, running away for a night or two. I mean, you can still go to school and work two or three nights a week and probably get away with it if your parents aren't keeping close tabs on you. Um, like you said, the cell phones are big. They may um, talk about their daddy, and their daddy's not their father. It's yeah. their pimp, their exploiter. Yeah, older significant others. Mm -hmm. Tattoos can be a big one. Branding mm -hmm. is, it used to be bigger, and I think it's coming back. Branding their victims, either with a name or a trafficker's name or some sort of talk about money or loyalty, those types of things can be indicators. I think runaway is a big one. Once mm -hmm. someone's run away a couple of times, I think that's a big indicator that they're vulnerable to a trafficker. They may not be trafficked yet, but there's something going on where they don't, appreciate or get along with or there's something wrong in their home and so they're more transient than a lot of kids so they're out there I can't tell you how many cases we've had where there's a 15 year old at a bus stop at 2 in the morning well that's a huge red flag to a trafficker hey no one cares for me enough for me to be out there I may be that low-hanging fruit that you can exploit Oof. did you want to ask your question <clears throat> Uh, I was curious. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, well, my inclination is to ask why the Liam Neeson model doesn't work for these traffickers <laughs> and pimps, but uh, that's for we didn't say it didn't work. I didn't hear anyone <laughs> say it didn't work. <laughs> we would uh, like it to work. Um, but um, I was wondering: is there anything at a federal level uh, in terms of? I think I know the answer: is limiting uh, website hosts from posting these kinds of ads, either uh, from solicitors or the uh, traffickers? So uh, there's a game that's played. Is that the best way to describe it? There's a game that's played on the internet. One is, we only have jurisdiction in the United States. Many of these websites are outside our control. So if your website is hosted in the Netherlands, I have no control over that website. One, I can't subpoena that website, or at least my subpoena doesn't have any real clout in the Netherlands, and two is they know that they're not held accountable in the Netherlands. That's the first game. The second game is these websites don't come out and say, we're a prostitution website. They say, we're like Craigslist. You can sell whatever you want. And this is a, a dating site. This is a escort site. And so they're very careful about what they allow and what they don't allow. So it's a lot of hinting. And so Part of the challenge of prosecuting is Mike doesn't have an agreement for a very specific sex act for a very specific amount of money. It may be a half an hour for my time for this amount of money where you have to use this or you can't do this. That's how they usually look. So people go around it by saying it's a dance or it's a massage or it's an escort. They don't openly talk about it and there's a lot of rules about what you can and can't talk about to avoid law enforcement. And so those games get played on different websites depending on whether they're a local, when I say local, national website as opposed to an international website and how they may, may be affected. When Craigslist was shut down, Craigslist, their adult section was shut down for a while based on the amount of child victims and prostitution that was being handled on Craigslist. We didn't see a decrease in prostitution activity on the internet. We just saw it move to somewhere else. And so now it's a different website. And Craigslist was local, so I could send them a subpoena and say, I want to know the IP address, the phone number, and the email that this ad was posted to, and they would send it to me. Well, some of those ads have moved on to international websites where when I say I'd like the phone number, the IP address, and the, and the email, that I never get a response. And so 
it's not that um, we're not looking at those things, but it's one of those things where we're doing using the tools we can, but we know it's almost like squeezing a balloon. And so that's why we've tried to take the steps of going after the buyers, sort of the demand, like an economics model, right? If you decrease the demand, there's not that enticing money there. And also uh, doing sort of the public safety of trying to keep victims, trying to change their trajectory, trying to get them out of the life while we aggressively prosecute their traffickers so that it sends a message to other traffickers, the risk isn't worth it. And these websites, make they charge for the ads, they make millions and millions of dollars a month. Uh, one of the particular websites got a lot of pressure to, by uh, Chicago, Cook County, to not take MasterCard Visa to pay for, for the traffickers and the escorts to pay for these ads. And these credit card companies agreed to do it, and they basically agreed that they would not accept Visa, MasterCard, Discover Card, all those cards, sort of like the online gambling sites that were out there. What they did is they sort of revamped their system. Now they're using Bitcoin and using other ways to get money back into it so they're not using the credit card. So they're back in business again, back making millions of dollars. Again, they're figuring out workarounds to what, you know, when pressure is put on them. So instead of shutting down like Craigslist did and it got moved someplace else, they just sort of reinvented the wheel how they can make money a different way. But, uh, and they're, they're doing very well, still making lots of money. I got to do a ride along with Mike a couple of years ago, and it was so eye opening. I've done a lot of ride alongs, um, as has Representative Peluso, I'm sure. But this one was so eye opening, and what he has to do on a daily basis is hard work. It's really hard work. One thing I remember about that particular ride along, though, they were luring, they lure pimps, they lure Johns. And the person that was luring this particular John to, they were trying to stop him from being a John, obviously, was another guy. And I thought it's so interesting that a guy could lure as a girl. He was pretending to be a woman. And so he was on the police force. He was pretending to be a woman luring this other guy. And you gotta explain it different. Not dressed as a girl. Okay, he wasn't dressed. He was online. He was online <laughs> doing this. On, I'm sorry. You know? Uh, don't want them to imagine me being dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. I've never been known to tell a whole story all the time, so there you go. Anyway, wasn't that amazingly informative? I mean, it really was. Thank you so much. I appreciate you stopping what you were doing and coming out here. I'm sorry about the confusion to begin with, but. We're happy to hang out here. Other people have questions. I know the time is up, but I'm happy to stay around. Great. Okay, we appreciate that. So, getting back to business, thank you to our sponsors, PGE. We so appreciate Riverview Community Bank. Thank you very much, Larry. Gresham Barlow School District, Metro East Community Media. The flyers are out on the table. They could have one on each table, but out as you go, the flyers are here that tell when this particular um, government affairs luncheon is going to be rebroadcast. So be sure and pick that up. If you thought that this was amazing, you want to hear it again or show a friend, be sure and pick this up, uh, make that happen. Um, our next month, BLT is with the Secretary of State candidates. So I hope that you will be here. And if you have time, take a minute to fill out the, um, the evaluation form. We appreciate that. And let's give our three panelists another round of applause. And thank you for coming today.